Well, good morning. It looks like people are taking advantage of the beautiful weather and are enjoying themselves doing whatever. So we will pray blessings upon them. I also know that it is um, fall break for a lot of schools, including our preschool. So I hope that they are all having safe travels and being renewed. But I'm so glad that you are here this morning that you are here this morning. So, uh, uh, oh, here come a couple of folks. Um, so, a few announcements today. Boy, the Halloween candy is piling up, but you can never have too much Halloween candy. Is that a true statement? Is that right, guys? You can never have too much Halloween candy. So, uh, information about the uh, carnival is in your epistle, um, both the newsletter and the bulletin. If you are able to help, I know she still needs some some volunteers, some some trunks. I, I know a couple people. Michelle, anyway, said that she would be glad to provide the trunk if somebody could man it. Not yet. Come on up. You're next. Um, so, if you can do that, I hope that you will. Um, next Sunday will be uh, our Laity Sunday. That is the tradition in the Methodist Church when uh, we celebrate the work of all Christians. And our lay leader, Kit, is going to be preaching. There's also a hymn sing, I understand, right? So you, you will get to sing some of your favorite hymns as chosen by you. So come and uh, show Kit some love. So come early for the hymn sing um, and, and, and we'll look forward to it. And then after worship is our, uh, no, that's the 22nd. On the 22nd after worship is uh, our ad council meeting. And I hope that you can attend that. As I've said in the past, all our meetings are open in, in um, this church with a couple of exceptions. Um, we had our first workshop this week. If you will read your uh, newsletter, you'll find out more about it. It was called Relaunching Your Church, about how to get started with things after COVID. COVID is both a blessing and a curse. It was a curse in that it ended a lot of things that we want to, we fed our souls it's a blessing in that it ended a lot of things that we should have ended and, and need to do new. So uh, this is going to be helping us find new things to do and new ways to do it and um, be creative. We had a great team that was there, but it's not too late if you want to be part of the team. So I invite you to uh, speak with one of us about it. I'm asked Michelle to give you a little bit of information about some of the things we heard yesterday in the workshop. Good morning, everybody. So yes, this, this workshop yesterday was amazing. Um, one of the things they asked us to talk about is like, what are the things you love about your church, you know? And I'm thinking about how I love that we have open minds, open hearts, open doors. I love how my children are so welcomed and all children and all people. And we're trying to focus going forward in one, how do we deepen our relationships that we already have and make them, you know, stronger because there is a lot of disconnect with COVID. And I think we all kind of feel that like we're here with each other, but it's not as deep, but also like, how do we reach out to the people around us? Like the people who really need it the most. And, you know, going forward, we're trying to figure out who are the people we need to focus on and what our mission statement is. And we would love anybody who has the same kind of call that we do to like really, you know, strengthen um, our outreach and our, um, you know, personal connections with people. Come see Pastor Allison, see me. We would love to have you involved. Any other announcements? Steve's waving. Food. Uh, Steve continues. If you need food um, after church, see him. The food pantry will be open for help. Anything else? Don't forget your prayer cards. Um, the ushers will be collecting them during the singing of the first hymn, as well as during the passing of the peace. So um, I've already taken several back to Steve, but uh, you not too late. Let them know that you have a prayer card. 
All right, let's put our feet on the floor, sit up straight, and take a deep breath. Breathe in God's love. And as you breathe out, breathe out all those worries and distractions that brought that you brought with you. And breathe in the peace of God. And breathe out all your burdens. Lay them on God. Let us continue our worship in music. Let us pray. Heavenly God, we gather as strangers and friends searching for new ways to live and follow you. Jesus, our Savior, come and live among us 
that we might imitate you more closely in our daily life. May our worship be filled with your spirit, transforming us into brothers and sisters and conforming us to your glorious purpose. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able. Our hymn of praise is Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord.
Peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us exchange signs of God's love and reconciliation with one another. we move into our time of prayer, our prayer hymn is the first verse of Into My Heart, and at the conclusion of the prayer, we'll finish the song. So let us sing. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do pray that you are coming into our hearts today, that you will abide in us as we abide in you, for you are the source of life 
as we said last week, you have the words of life. And we put our trust in you. As we will hear shortly, Abraham put his trust in you. We know that you hear us, Lord, and that you are faithful and keep your promises. Knowing that, Lord, we boldly come before you and offer to you our prayers. We pray especially today for peace in the land where your son walked, where your people took root, for Israel. We know that there is great fear and great pain and great anger. But we pray, Lord, that you are at work there and that your will be done. And may we be peacemakers, Lord. We pray, Lord, for Grant, who is paralyzed in a sports activity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for the Reverend Lisa Beth White, who has a brain tumor. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for John Tomzik, who has entered hospice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for Janet, as she begins treatment for breast cancer. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for Doug, diagnosed with stage three kidney cancer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And we offer a thanks and a praise today, Lord, that Dan Maloney is here in worship with us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We also thank you, Lord, and give you praise that Micah Roldan has recovered from her heat exhaustion that she was treated for yesterday. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. But we pray for her father, Michael, who is in the hospital with an infection, and they are not quite sure what's causing it yet. So, Lord, we ask for wisdom and for your presence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for Matt, who is in Israel, that he may be safe. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And we pray for Debbie as she goes to this week to her new home in Tennessee. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And Lord, help us not just to turn these over to you and then think that all our work is done. May we continue to pray for people throughout the week and where it is laid upon our hearts, may we act to be your hands and feet in the world. We pray all these things in the name of your Son who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Well, Miss Kristen is out today, so she asked me to help out. So I invite all the children and the young at heart and our um, uh, Kids Zone crew to come on up. Come on, have a seat up here. Good morning, Katie. You can have a seat down there. Good morning, Annabelle. Good morning, Evie. Good morning, Callan. How are you? Have you ever heard the term pinky swear? You know what a pinky swear is? What's a pinky swear? It's a, it's, it's a promise, and it's a real serious promise, one that you, you aren't going to break, right? Well, God doesn't exactly pinky swear things to us, but when God promises something, we can trust it. Is, would you agree with that? It might not happen as fast as we want it to, but it will happen. You know, our word right now is faith. And that's to believe in God's presence and to hope. That means we're going to trust in God's promises. And we're going to hear about God's promise to Abraham and how Abraham trusted God. Let's celebrate wonder, okay? Hello friends, it's Samuel. Abraham and Sarah went on a long journey of faith with God. One day, God invited Abraham outside and told him to look at all the stars. While Abraham was looking up, God promised him a family as big as the number of stars in the sky. That was a lot of stars. This was really hard to believe. How could this be possible? Abraham and his wife Sarah were already very old, and they didn't have any children yet. How would they have as many kids as there were stars? Even though he didn't know how it would happen, Abraham had faith and believed in God's promises. He believed that God's promises would come true, even if he didn't understand how. Abraham showed his faith by trusting God on the journey. Sometimes it can be really hard to want something that you can't have yet, even when you've asked God about it. Abraham and Sarah really wanted children, but they didn't have any yet. What are the things that you want for your life? I think that I want to be an astronaut one day. It'd be so cool to walk on the moon and step into the sky I see every day. I want to get on a space shuttle. Maybe even go to other planets one day. That would be such a cool job. Well, I may or may not be an astronaut someday. We'll have to wait and see. But I do know that whatever my journey is, it will be good because God will go with me and I can always have faith in God. Now it's your turn to wonder. So before we head out, how about if we have a quick prayer? Would you pray with me? God, help us to believe even when we don't understand and to trust in your promise, especially the promise that you will always be with us. Amen. Thank you. There are so many good things happening here, whether it's the music or the children or, or the um, work of the food pantry or open door gym. So many good things which are possible because of your generosity. Thank you. Now let us worship God with our gifts and our offerings. Will the ushers come forward as the... Um, Praise team leads us.
Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give back to you, to trust in your promises to us. So take what we have given to you and bless it and use it in the service of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So one year, I took what's now become known as a staycation. You know, I took some vacation time and stayed home. And one of the things on my list of things to do while I was at home was to clean out the closets. They had just gotten too full. So I took some of that old stuff, books, videos, dishes, to the uh, assistance ministry that we participated in in that area. Uh, They had a thrift shop. So I went to make a donation. And lots of the members of our church worked at the thrift shop during the week. And one of them saw me coming out. And given the time of year it was, she stopped and she said, Is there something I need to know? Are you moving? (laughs) No, I told her, I was just getting rid of some of my stuff. You know, we all have stuff. And the longer we live in one place, the more stuff we seem to have. George Carlin reflects on this in one of his classic routines. That's all I want. That's all you need in life is a little place for your stuff, you know? Everybody's got a little place for their stuff. This is my stuff. That's your stuff. That'll be his stuff over there. That's all you need in life is a little place for your stuff. That's all your house is. A place to keep your stuff. If you didn't have so much stuff, you wouldn't need a house. You could just walk around all the time. A house is just a pile of stuff with a cover on it. You can see that when you're taking off in an airplane. You look down and you see everybody's got a little pile of stuff. And when you leave your house, you've got to lock it up. Wouldn't want somebody to come by and take some of your stuff. They always take the good stuff. They never bother with that junk you're saving. All they want is the shiny stuff. That's what your house is. A place to keep your stuff while you go out and get more stuff. (laughs) And sometimes you got to move. Got to get a bigger house. Why? No room for your stuff anymore. And what do we decide when we have too much old stuff and need room for more stuff, but we can't get a bigger house? We have a rummage sale. Why do you think Jesus would stay about all the stuff in our lives? Not not just the physical stuff, 
but the emotional and the physical stuff as well. Does any of our stuff help us live kingdom lives? Well, let's hear what Jesus has to say about it in Matthew. This is from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21 and 24 to 34, 19. Oh, 34, excuse me. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust consume them and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where, man, where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where there, your treasure is, there your heart will be also. No one can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow neither toil, excuse me, how they grow, they neither toil or spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not more clothe you, you of little faith? If therefore do not worry, saying, what will we eat, and what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who, shine, who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. Words I'm sure we've all heard before and that we all struggle to live by. Words Jesus practiced, traveling light and unencumbered by too much stuff or clutter. What I have learned is that we do not set out to collect stuff and let our lives get cluttered. It happens gradually as more things come in than go out. It's hard to let go of stuff, whether in our houses or in our lives. So how is Jesus helpful in decluttering our lives to help us get rid of some of that stuff we don't need anymore? Did you know that the U.S. Census Bureau has kept track of the size of the houses we live in over the years? In 1950, the average house was 893 square feet. I imagine some of us know what it's like to live in that house. Today, the average size of the house has tripled to over 2,500 square feet. And while our houses have been getting larger, the size of the family that, uh, that's living in them has been getting smaller. In 1950, the houses were built to give about 290 square feet per family member. Today, houses provide 971 square feet per family member. Think about that. Today, we give the same square footage to one person in a family as a whole house did in 1950. And trust me, nothing will motivate you to declutter your life than moving. <laughs> now, some people have this practice where they just throw everything in the boxes and when they get to wherever they're going, they sort it out. I can't do that. 
I declutter as I pack. And every time I move, the amount of what I have to take declines. Let someone else do the de decluttering, though, and you'll see how much is just stuff. When I moved to California from Hawkins, Texas, the one thing I knew that I should not bring was most of the stuff that was in my pantry. You know, the open flour and, and, and the half of a jar of honey or whatever. That was not going to travel well. But as I went to, to, to get rid of it, I, I just couldn't. So I called someone who had offered to help me pack, and I said, I have a very specific job for you, and you're going to think it's crazy. She said, what? I said, here's a garbage can. There's my pantry. Except for the things on this shelf, I want you to throw everything away and put it in the bag and take it out and put it in the garbage can so that I can't do it. Because I just couldn't. I may not have been uh, raised during the Depression, but my parents were. You just didn't throw that stuff away. And then we came to cleaning out my father's house. He had moved into assisted living. His house was going to be sold. And we needed to basically, he'd taken everything he was going to take from it. We needed to either give it away or throw it away. We actually hired a dumpster. And my father liked to tinker in the garage. And over the years, he'd accumulated a lot of stuff. You know, he had the baby food jars with the little odds and ends of the washers and the screws and all that. And, and we knew that he would never be able to throw any of that away and he would never use any of it again. So it was my brother-in-law and I who just went through and unscrewed it and went into the dumpster. Unscrew and into the dumpster. Because we could look at it without the emotion that was attached to his. Now, I bet over the years that either I or someone else has given away or thrown away something that at that time I would have kept. And you know, I haven't missed any of it. And for me, that means I can travel light. I can go wherever the bishop sends me. I have enough that where I am feels like home and what I have will fit wherever I go. Well, I still have some growing edges particularly in the realm of books. Anybody who looks in my office knows that. So my practice now is for every book, book I bring in, I have to give one away. Now, the church is no different from our lives, mostly because the church is made up of us. You see, it has stuff too. And I'm not talking about the baptismal font or that picture that Mrs. Jones donated a hundred years ago and we hang in a corner so that we don't have to see it, but we can bring it out anytime her family comes back for a visit. I'm sure you have one. Every church does. I'm talking about other kinds of stuff. The theologian and writer Phyllis Tickle wrote a book a few years ago called The Great Emergence, How Christianity is Changing and Why. And she says that every 500 years or so, the church feels compelled to have a giant rummage sale. And what she means is that every 500 years, the church finds that its structures and institutions have become so cumbersome that they are an obstruction to its mission of making disciples. And in the process of holding this rummage sale, the faith is renewed and spread into new geographic and demographic places. Some might argue that is what is happening with the United Methodist Church today as we grapple with the number of churches that are disaffiliating and General Conference 2024 comes up. That's a lot about what we talked about at the workshop yesterday, about how we get ready for the new things that God is going, doing and what we have to maybe let go of that has become clutter and not effective. So how do we streamline church for ministry in a post-pandemic 21st century world. What is cluttering us up? Yeah, our exterior clutter can also be a reflection of what's going on inside. So take making disciples, for instance. We can make it this complicated, stuff-filled fixation we got creeds and doctrines, dogmas, rituals, denominational stances, liturgical dances, observances, 
saints, feast days, committee meetings, liturgies, political turf organs, worship bulletins, newsletters, stained glass. Now, don't misunderstand me. All of those are good things. But they become clutter in the life of a church when they stop being the means and start being the end. If you, if something is there simply for its own sake and it obscures both our relationship with God or our neighbor and hinders our mission of making disciples for Jesus Christ, it has become stuff that is cluttering up our lives. So it happens in our houses, it happens in our churches, and it happens in our spiritual lives. I read four different devotions, uh, devotional materials every day. A daily devotion from Father Richard Rohr at the Center of Action and Contemplation, the Upper Room Disciplines, a daily reflection, right now it's from Philip Yancey, and something from another writer. Right now I'm reading um, Reuben Job's work on, with John Wesley. But one year I was struggling with something from another writer. What I was reading were daily reflections and they weren't very long, but they just didn't speak to me. Now, sometimes I need to read something that doesn't speak to me where I am spiritually because God is trying to move me. And sometimes the farther I go in something, the more I discover. But no, neither of those things seem to be true with this book. And I really struggle with what should I do? Should I keep on going? I've never met a book that I didn't want to end even if I hated it. But I felt like I could be growing more effectively with something else. And so after several months, I let it go. Something that has enriched us for a long time may have run its course. Our spiritual lives are not static. They should be growing. In the same way that the books you enjoyed when you were in elementary school are not necessarily what you would pick up to read today, we need to think about what, is feed, what fed us in the past and is it still feeding us now? As we mature spiritually, our practices will change, should change. But man, it's hard to let go of the ones that nurtured us to this point. So we tend to keep on adding and never letting go. Now, I've learned the value of decluttering from some of those TV shows or from uh, Marie Kondo. You remember Marie Kondo? If it gives you joy, keep it. If not, let it go. And if any of you are in the mind of it's time to sell your house, the first thing they'll tell you is to declutter it. Well, the same is true with our spiritual life. Okay, now I know that all of you are now sitting there thinking about the closets in your house and when you can do a spring cleaning in October. But let's, let's think again right now about your spiritual life. Jesus invites us in these verses from Matthew to live kingdom-centered lives, free of the clutter that accumulates over time, to store up our treasure in heaven, to let go of worry and trust in God, to live today fully and in the presence of our Heavenly Father. Jesus reminds us that stuff won't save us, not even religious stuff. Only he can do that. Jesus wants us to know that we are enough. God has made us in God's image. God declared us good. We don't need a lot of fancy clothing or decorations to show our worthiness. Because we already are. So how do we declutter our spiritual lives? Now, organization experts give advice about living in a clutter-free home. You've got to sort and evaluate on a regular basis. It may not be, does this give me joy? But, but what value does this has? For instance, if you say it's important to you, why is it in the back of a closet covered with dust? 
Or if you haven't worn that outfit in a year, maybe you need to give it away. And the same thing is true for your spiritual life. If you say a practice is important, then do it. I hear people say all the time they want to know the Bible, but they never go to a Bible study. And a wise pastor once told me, serious Bible study should always be done in a community. People are quick to add names to a prayer list, but then don't take the time to pray regularly. Interestingly, we should not be afraid to add. In helping people get rid of their clutter, I've noticed that experts often add something. Maybe it's a new desk or a closet organizer or shelves, baskets or bins. It's a structure to help the stuff become manageable. And again, it's the same for your spiritual life. If you want to say, if you want to know the Bible, then find a study. Not only is it better to study, do these in community, when we make a commitment to someone else saying we'll be somewhere, for instance, we're more likely to keep it. Weight loss experts will tell you that. If you want to enrich your prayer life, then set aside a specific time and a specific place or even join with others in a prayer circle. Find a structure that will support your spiritual life and help it stay focused like a lattice supports a vine that grows up it and vines seek, seek the structure I have a jasmine in the right by the front door of the parsonage and I have put a hook there that I'm hanging a, a hummingbird feeder on and I've just watched that jasmine climb up it it wants a structure to give it support well I finished my vacation and guess what? The clutter just started all over again. It accumulates until I cannot stand it anymore and I literally take time off to deal with it. And I vow every time that this time will be different. Is that the story of your spiritual life? It can be different. Learn what is important and keep it. Discover what has outlived its usefulness to you. Acknowledge and honor how it helped you grow spiritually. And then pass it on to someone else who needs it. Now I invite you to close your eyes. And I want you to visualize your spiritual life as a house. Here's the room of worship. Here's the room of prayer. Here's the room of Bible study. Here's the room of fellowship. What room needs some attention? What would you need to do to get it in shape? And what will it take to keep it that way? And finally, are you willing to do it? Amen. Our hymn of dedication is an expression of that desire that we have to live that life with Jesus. Just a closer walk with thee. I invite you to stand as you're able as we sing.
invite you this time, if you want, after the benediction, to have a seat and listen to the, the postlude. It's so beautiful. Now, where will we go and who will we be? We go out into the world to be God's people. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit walk with us every day. Amen.